first weeks of 1834, the scarlet fever robbed the poet Friedrich Rückert of his two youngest children, Louisa and Ernst. In the coming months, he wrote over 400 Kindertotenlieder as a form of private mourning. They were only made public in 1872, several years after his death. Their appeal for Gustav Mahler some 30 years later was not a matter of first-hand experience. In 1901, he was still unmarried and six years shy of losing his own daughter Maria to diphtheria. Indeed, it was the composer's own mortality that likely drew him to these dark texts. Earlier in the year, harried and overworked, a bout of ghastly internal bleeding had felled and nearly killed him. The impact on his art and outlook was profound. That summer's efforts included the Fifth Symphony's funeral march, a stoic valediction to the fairy tale innocence of his early works, and several of Rückert's more melancholy texts. The poem that would eventually open his cycle of five Kindertotenlieder is built from four couplets, each of which is organized around a basic binary of light and darkness. Now the sun will rise as brightly as if no misfortune had befallen in the night. The misfortune befell me alone. The sun shines on everything. You must not enfold the night in you. You must immerse it in eternal light. A little lamp went out in my tent. Hail to the joyous light of the world. The first couplet sets the scenario. Here, the darkness and light are literally night and day, times of tragedy and aftermath. The second couplet clarifies the deeply personal nature of this misfortune, drawing out the grieving father's alienation from the world at large, which is illumined by a sun that cannot warm him. The third couplet, with its curious second-person injunction, brings us to the crux. Here, the darkness takes on its full symbolic value as the spiritual malaise of the bereaved and the light shows itself as the chance for salvation. The last couplet can be read from several angles. Peter Russell takes it to express, quote, emotional resolve and finally optimism. As we'll see, Mahler saw at least the potential for something darker and less conclusive. In the paper's next three sections, I want to look closely at Mahler's setting beginning with its overall form. I'll then tease out a number of long-range musical processes that have mostly gone unnoticed until now, many of them involving contour transformations across the song's first three strophes, or rotations. And I'll close by putting these musical insights in the service of a more nuanced hearing of the song, one that more fully explores its complex psychomechanics of grief, denial, and hope. So let's begin with the song's form. Analysts agree that its basic framework is a varied strophic design, with strophes 2 and 4 altering the first only superficially, or so it seems. But opinions have varied on the third and the penultimate strophe, which veers into seemingly new territory to deliver the song's expressive climax. Most views tend to emphasize the striking difference of this music from what surrounds. Mary Dargy calls it a contrasting middle, and Zoltan Roman reads it as the B section of a large reprisen bar form. Another strategy is to hear strophe 3 as the development section of a large sonata form. One can certainly see the appeal of this view, since it builds a bridge between Mahler's song and symphonic corpuses, and accounts for the unusually strong sense of return in strophe 4. But this angle raises a number of concerns, among them the fact that labeling strophe 3 as a development seems in some cases to excuse the analyst from further, more careful inquiry and comparison and this in turn can lead to breezy overstatements like that of Donald Mitchell, who writes that in this so-called development section, the established strophic pattern is virtually abandoned. Now, I read Mitchell's comments a long time ago, and as a casual listener they seem to make some sense. But looking more closely, he's completely wrong on this point. In fact, all five of the song's basic strophe units recur, and in their original order. But their transformation is extensive enough that it is easy to miss. It also seems to edge us beyond the boundaries of mere strophic variation, toward a related technique that is basic to Mahler's symphonic writing, that of rotational form. Indeed, having studied Mahler's music closely for a decade now, I can think of no better piece to demonstrate so economically how creative Mahler could be when using presentational order as a constant around which everything else can change. So let's look now at the five basic parts of the first strophe 
and then examine their transformation in the third. And for both tasks, we'll do a walkthrough first and then listen to an entire strophe. Strophe one begins with a spare two-part counterpoint for winds in which, as Julian Johnson writes, the emptiness of bereavement borders on the catatonic. In the next two sections, Mahler sets a descending lament against an accompaniment of bare semitones and follows this with an interlude that plays the same tune in diminution. Section 1.4 finishes the first couplet in the parallel major with a rough retrograde of the previous melody and an ornate descent into its final cadence and the strophe ends with a brief nachspiel in which the luminous tonic major fades back into minor. Let's listen. Mahler's second strophe cycles through all these sections, but with some telling changes we'll see later. For now, let's look at how the third strophe transforms this basic schema. Here we see the opening of strophe 1 on top and the beginning of strophe 3 on the bottom. Notice first how Mahler changes the introduction so that its main motive is now sequenced upward instead of downward. And it leads into an orchestral statement of what was previously the opening vocal melody one that's now harmonized in parallel thirds, and set with no bass line, but with its former tenor displaced up by two octaves. The singer finally enters in section 3.3. Here Mahler doubles the length of his interlude and adds the voice in mirror image counterpoint. From here the transformations become more extreme. Strophe 3.4, again on the bottom, preserves the contour, chromatic ascent, and opening rhythm of 1.4. And here, too, the voice moves only by step until the cadence. But the harmony is thoroughly changed. The tonic articulation at its opening is much stronger. It is, in fact, the first strong tonic since the beginning of strophe 3. And its closing cadence is in an eerily bleak D Phrygian. The strophe's closing unit, 3.5, actually has very little in common with the close of strophe 1. Rather, it's a vast expansion of the second nachspiel, strophe 2.5, which we'll see shortly. But notice, and this is crucial, that this expanded episode, the expressive climax of the entire piece, is built around reiterations of the first strophe's closing vocal figure, the florid Nacht Melisma. Also notice that rather than beginning on five and proceeding to tonic, this Nachspiel begins with a strongly rooted tonic and then elides directly into the fourth strophe's introduction. Now before we listen to strophe 3 in its entirety, let's take an aerial view of how these changes reconfigure the formal functions of the five units. The introduction remains introductory, of course. But now the instrumental setting of the couplet 1 melody seems merely to extend this introductory space rather than begin something new. We can even hear section 3.3 doing the same. It's true that the voice enters here, and that's an important demarcation. But the harmony and texture, the absence of any bass line, still give the impression of delay, of a process that is really still waiting to get underway. And that sense of strong initiation finally arrives in strophe 3.4, with its arpeggio-enriched texture and powerful tonic downbeat. And like 3.4, section 3.5 also stands more firmly on its own than its strophe 1 counterpart, 
Rather than a Nachspiel per se, it has the effect of a developmental and then retransitional interlude, one that divides the piece at the highest level of form. So let's now listen to strophe 3 in its entirety. It's worth mentioning that this extremity of strophic transformation is unique in all of Mahler's early and middle period songs. Rather, Mahler broaches here a formal problem he would only confront more fully in his late works, that is, how to preserve strophic continuity while shaping the rhetorical surface with broader strokes, with transtrophic contrasts and teleologies in mind. In other words, how to produce a cyclical form that doesn't just string together closed units, but rather gives the impression of a larger, top-down structure. With the present song, I eventually discovered that others had beat me to these insights about its form. A number of German-language authors note the strophic basis of couplet 3, and even, in the case of Elisabeth Schmierer, expressly reject its labeling as a sonata-form development. But these same analyses are a bit disappointing for me in that they offer few thoughts on the narrative or teleological purpose of these strophic transformations. That is to say, they show us that Mahler made certain changes, but refrain from speculating why or asking what broader interpretive angle they might spur. In one sense, this kind of restraint is typical of German language scholarship, but we might find it at least a bit surprising in light of Adorno's bold promise that such teleology is in fact the key to Mahler's art. Adorno heard a kind of varied strophe design underlying much of Mahler's symphonic music as part of what he called the composer's variant technique and he believed that these large-scale transformations were governed by a certain organic teleology which can be studied down to the very last interval. Nothing is unaffected by succession. What happens must always take specific account of what happened before. In the next section, I'm going to offer a more specifically teleological view of the first three strophes by examining the rather subtle changes between strophes 1 and 2 to ask how these are predictive of what follows. In other words, in the next section we'll aim to hear strophe 3 not just as a departure or contrast, but as the culmination of an ongoing process. For me, the most interesting teleological view of this song is one focused on contour. And we should note from the outset that Mahler's textures here seem designed to bring contour to the foreground. Much of the song is built from simple, directed stepwise motions over pedal points, often harmonized at the third or sixth. A typical instance is strophe 1.4, which planes parallel thirds over an oscillating dominant bass. Even themes that we hear for the first time as single lines often come back later, harmonized in parallel motion over pedal points. We saw this already in strophe 3 when Mahler brought back the opening vocal melody, shown here on top, harmonized in parallel thirds. Mm -hmm. 
could go on, but the point is simply that rising and falling motions, and more importantly the opposition of such motions, take on greater importance in this song than in most, including the others in this cycle. So let's look now at how these directed motions change as the song progresses. The opening strophe begins with a series of descents that eventually give way to a rising impulse. The introductory sequence falls conspicuously, as do the melodies of sections 1.2 and 1.3. But the second couplet reverses course at the shift into major. And as Matt Bailey-Shea notes, the Nachspiel that follows echoes that long-range ascent twice, though each time with less energy, the first beginning with the solo horn leap, and the second at the final cadential dominant, with all voices ascending into tonic. And notice that both of these ascents are further instances of parallel motion over pedal points. In strophe 2, the vocal sections remain more or less the same. But the directional qualities of the instrumental units begin to change, and in ways that directly anticipate the events of strophe 3. So now we're going to be focusing on vertical slices of the grid, particularly those of sections 1, 3, and 5. Mahler begins strophe 2 by trimming the opening sequential unit off his introduction, strongly attenuating its descending character. So here's the first. In this, the second introduction looks ahead to the explicitly ascending sequence that we saw introducing strophe 3. Moving on, the interlude, section 2.3, now contains an internal repetition that moves its descending line higher in pitch space, giving a global impression of registral upshift. With this subtle upward push, strophe 2 paves the way for the strophe 3 variant, whose inverted melody will push explicitly upward, also with repetition. The most extensive and interesting change in strophe 2 comes in its Nachspiel, however. Notice first that the opening horn call, which used to conclude on E, now descends gloomily to tonic. And the line it sets into motion trails chromatically downward through several distorted iterations of the Nacht motive from strophe 1. And, as in the first Nachtspiel, these directional gestures are reinforced by parallels over a pedal point. Only here, of course, the sixths descend rather than rise. This is a crucial moment on the road to strophe 3, because while it clearly echoes aspects of the first Nachspiel, especially that horn call, its descending voice leading and distorted Nacht motives point forward to the climactic Nachspiel 3, whose Nacht motives are borne along a series of overlapping chromatic cascades. To complete the matrix, we'll need to consider how the vocal portions of strophes 1 and 2 relate to their correlates in strophe 3. In each case, we find some degree of kinetic reversal. Recall that strophe 3.2 is the orchestral setting of the opening lament melody, 
though the tune itself still tends downward, the entire texture, shorn of its baseline, is shifted upward into a brilliant new register. And though the second vocal section, that's strophe 3.4, rises and falls like its predecessors, that arc is more balanced now. The descent is not merely a cadential figure, but an excruciatingly drawn-out decline through a minor ninth. At the risk of being a bit reductive, I'd like to simplify this rather busy diagram to clarify what I see as a remarkable transstrophic transformation. I'm now using up and down arrows to mark the contour impulses that I hear governing each section. And what we see is that with each strophe, the ascending impulse begins earlier, such that by the time we've arrived at strophe 3, the directional tendency of strophe 1 has been completely reversed. In other words, where the song's opening tends downward and then reverses course, the climactic strophe begins with several effortful ascents, only to culminate in a series of marked declines. And since strophe 4 is a reprise of strophe 1, this also means that these contour transformations are more or less entirely undone as soon as they're accomplished. Now, these contour processes are certainly interesting enough in their own right, but I'm specifically interested in their interpretive potential. In the next and last section, I'm going to offer a more comprehensive reading of the song, one that hears Mahler undertaking a kind of psychological excavation of the grieving lead subject, and one that ultimately forecloses entirely on Rückert's promise for salvation. Central to this reading is the idea that contour gestalts can serve as psychodramatic signifiers. It's a simple idea, but one that is fundamental to opera and most theatrical genres, where ascents through pitch space routinely connote arousal, exertion, or expectancy, while descending gestalts tend to shadow expressions of lethargy, disorientation, or dread. And this will allow us to hear Mahler's music doing more than just setting the mood for this rather somber poem. Instead, we can hear it as a window onto the lead subject's evolving inner state, which may or may not correspond to the text we hear him reciting. Analysts have long noted a kind of directional and modal paradox in Mahler's setting of strophe one. While the singer hails the rising sun, his vocal line descends darkly, only to rise again, warming into D major at the revelation of his nocturnal anguish. What's strange to me is that this contradiction is usually reduced to a proof, as Peter Russell writes, that Mahler does not allow the details of the poem's imagery to rigidly dictate his compositional choices. I find this rather bland approbation disappointing, and not only for its whiff of old-fashioned absolute music partisanship. Such apologetics rule out, prematurely, I think, the chance that Mahler, the master ironist, may be up to something subtler here than just ignoring the implications of Rückert's text. For me, this pointed rift between music and text brilliantly reveals the stricken father's own detachment from reality, and even from the words he speaks. His gaze may fall on the rising sun, but his vocal lament makes clear how grievously loss has chilled his soul. He cannot be warmed from without. But he can be from within, which is precisely what happens in the strophe's second half, as fact yields to fantasy and the tonic minor blooms into major. Hanging every hope on the hypothetical as-if, as if no misfortune had befallen in the night, the lead subject rouses his line into a tender ascent, the gently rocking accompaniment seeming to breathe life itself back into the empty cradle. And yet its climax embroiders the word Nacht, the very symbol of his misery, with such incongruous fondness as to suggest not acceptance, but rather a repression of harsh reality. In the interlude that follows, however, fantasy falters and the cold light of empty dawn returns. Twice the music stirs, seized by an ever-weakening impulse to draw itself erect, but after the first ascent collapses into a tonic minor 6-4 chord, the best it can achieve is an exhausted climb by third up to F, at the imperfect cadence where the strophe comes to rest. <laughs> 
We know already that strophe 2 reuses the falling and rising vocal units of strophe 1. But now, and this is critical, now they go with the grain of Rupert's text, suggesting a more sober outlook and a more frank recognition of the inalterable. This time, the protagonist's Unglück is coupled directly to the lament phrase, while the major mode consequent turns outward, offering bittersweet tribute to the sun that shines on everything. This D major cadence is spurred not by fantasy, but rather by sympathy with those more fortunate, and even perhaps with unfeeling nature itself. But by comparing himself with those less wretched, the singer is clearly drawn into a crisis. For while the first Nachspiel could still hold its head high, the second one yields entirely to wrenching grief, with the once mellifluous Nacht motive souring into a sinister chromatic aberration. The new directional profile of strophe 3, its commencement with several linear and registral ascents, suggests a marshalling of resolve at the approach to the denouement. At the declaration that you must not enfold the night within you, Mahler simply inverts the opening lament, a kind of simple contrapuntal epiphany that suffuses the line with a new, unforeseen optimism. But his reconfigured formal functions make clear that the next line is the decisive moment, Rückert's paradoxical imperative to immerse the night in eternal light. As the violins revive the first Nachspiel's hopeful horn call, the singer pushes resolutely upward, inching ever closer to the eternal light and its promised salvation. But then it all unravels. At the approach to Ferzenken, the vocal line literally plunges downward through a minor ninth, its descent broken only by an anemic deflection of F to F sharp at the last sounding of Licht. The extraordinary cadence that follows, a kind of Phrygian authentic cadence whose dominant is actually a half-diminished chord, makes clear the depths of the crisis. affirmation has slipped away. Rather than submerging the darkness in light, the music unleashes the darkness itself as if to purge the menacing Nacht motives, which come forth here in demonic, pointillistically scored torrents. But to fully grasp this interlude's tragic depth, we need to look back to the very first Nachspiel, and in particular to its dynamically charged opposition of supertonic chords. Matt Bailiche has written insightfully about its ersatz dominant, E major over A, and the curious burst of ascending energy that lifts it into tonic. I hear this rising supertonic chord as a direct response to, indeed a kind of willed revocation of, the Neapolitan that precedes, with its catastrophic nose dive into the minor tonic. Thus, the first Nachspiel can be heard setting two kinetically vectored supertonics against one another, the rising E major and the sinking E flat. Let's listen to bar three of the given score. there's no mistaking that the sinking impulse reigns triumphant in the strophe three climax. Not only does the singer's terminal plunge into Ferzenken revive the Phrygian nosedive from Nachspiel I, the entire interlude that follows is saturated with Neapolitan chords and Phrygian harmonies, most of which resolve directly either to the local tonic G or the concluding tonic D. <laughs> As the title of this talk suggests, I hear this climactic outpouring as a kind of negative catharsis, an event that the literary critic Eric Bentley describes as an expenditure of emotion that leads not to a new beginning, but to the admission of exhaustion. The stricken father has called forth the knight out of himself to immerse it in eternal light, 
but the promised light never comes, and the effort leaves him empty and spent, left to trudge stoically through the fourth and final strophe. Despite the trailing persistence of the interlude's nervous eighth notes, which lend its first couplet a halting, vaguely asthmatic character, the fourth strophe itself hews closely to the original template. Mahler's well-meaning apologists tend to see this faithful reprise as a deference to purely musical logic. I hear something more disturbing, though, a compounded presence of absence. Not only are we made to feel the emptiness of the cradle, we're also privy now to the vacancy of Rukert's promise for salvation. The lead subject's emotional efforts have accomplished virtually nothing. We end right where we began. Serving as a cataleptic postlude to the song as a whole, Strophe 4 finds him treading the same fruitless cycle of effortful optimism and enervated dejection that closed the first strophe, and in this light, the poem's closing salute to the joyous light of the world may well ring ironically, even bitterly. But if the musical persona is bitter, he is not, I think, broken. By repeating the poem's final clause, to the joyous light of the world, precisely as the final Nachspiel sinks into minor, Mahler certainly underscores the depths of his narrator's alienation. But he also shows us, critically, I think, that there is still fight in him, for his last gesture is to draw himself upward, again defying the Neapolitan's nihilistic pull with an energetically rising supertonic. By closing the song with this re-traversal of familiar ground, I like to imagine that Mahler is treating the cyclicality of bereavement with a kind of frankness that Rückert, in its very real clutches, could not directly confront. Grieving bends us to the earth but does not break us, and that is our fate. Every day the sun rises again on our sadness. Every day we carry on. Mm -hmm.